Hey, 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 hello, here we are again, um, talking about the baby assassins, this time about nice days, told ya, um, yeah, and if you uh, have watched some of the videos on this channel, you probably know that I like this series very, very much, and uh, yeah, there are a million reasons why I shouldn't be recording this video and I'm extremely tired and sleepy and I have like 10 million pages notes that I haven't put in order and stuff like that so I can totally see me re-recording half this video tomorrow so if you see strange cuts with the decoration changing or me changing or whatever changing um yeah because I didn't do it the way I wanted to but I guess that's why you make videos because then you can edit and stuff I, I don't edit so much probably you noticed by now that I'm not the big editor but uh, anyway I, I just wanted to get this out into the world as soon as possible because I'm really 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 hyped um, I expected a lot. I went through the whole filmography part of it. The first few movies I have are always are already um, discussed here, and yeah, now I uh, I was in this uh, super hype state. I bought some stuff too. For example, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. I bought more, but uh, this will come sometime in October. Uh, I, and uh, movie, I've got the finally the Blu-ray for the first movie. Um, sadly enough, this new re-release. I mean, it makes sense that they don't put out the limited edition with the bonus disc uh, again, but um, would have been nice. Anyway, uh, yeah, the standard edition, at least with audio commentary. So, like I mentioned in the other video, uh, probably I will talk about the audio commentaries at some point again. And uh, it's a good reason to re-watch those first two movies. And, uh, yeah, anyway. So, today we are gonna talk about nice days. I will handle it the same way I handled it the few last times. But I guess this is maybe more interesting for new viewers. So I will very shortly um, explain what I'm about to do. So first I'm gonna give a rating, then I will talk about the movie a little bit like spoiler free, just my general impressions. Um, then we'll, we will talk a tiny bit about the interviews from this uh, nice pamphlet. There's an audio uh, drama as well. I haven't listened to this one yet, but as uh, there will be a a video about the audio dramas at some point too. I have to listen to them a million times more to completely get everything, but uh, it will be fun. Anyway, um, so we will talk about the interviews in the pamphlet. It's not that much, but there are some interesting small things. And then we will go into the movie a little bit uh, deeper and um, with spoilers and everything. So there's always a chance for you if you feel like, okay, now there's too much spoiler for me, you can just stop and come back someday after you watch the movie and um, listen to me talk more about it. But uh, yeah, for everyone who's just curious how much I liked it, surprise, surprise, it's a five out of five. Uh, it's a wonderful movie, probably one of my favorite movies this year. I thought about it like, that's the big issue always, like what's your favorite movie, not just in a year or in general. And um, I recently came up with the question, that, like what's what's actually the best? Is it the one that I watch the most or is it the one that I feel like is actually the best movie? For example, for this year, I would probably say that maybe Furiosa is... Uh, probably better movie but I will rewatch this way more often and probably have more fun with this so maybe the best movie of the year maybe there's a chance at least like one of the top movies this year so um my hair is going crazy like usual but today it's, it annoys me very much um anyway so, so this is definitely one of my top movies this year and I watched it twice in the cinema. It was 
uh, glorious and wonderful and um maybe i will go one more time but there, there will be the documentary as well so uh let's see how much money i have to go again and uh, yeah let's maybe talk very briefly about the cast and crew because most of them are the same like usual we have these two um saudi izawa and uh, taka uh, akari takaishi well oh, here yeah, uh, different picture and um they're of course the main stars of the movie then we have um newcomer for this movie um sosuke ikematsu but i guess you know him by now because He's one of uh, the top guys in, the, in recent years. Not not just in recent years, but I feel like he's getting in bigger and bigger uh, movies if you consider The Last Samurai to not be a big movie. But I, I don't even remember who he played there, so I have no idea. Anyway, but uh, he was in Shoplifters, he was in Shin Kamen Rider, he was in Shinya Tsukamoto's Killing, um, he was in A Girl Missing, he was in Just Remembering. He's everywhere and uh, he's uh, wonderful and glorious and uh, you should all love him. And uh, yeah, seemingly he's trying to get more into action, which is uh, very nice because he's very good at it. Um, yeah, speaking of action, he was in Destruction Babies as well. I haven't seen Destruction Babies in years, but it's a... Uh, very very good movie and then we have of course uh, Atsuko Maeda um, you probably know her from AKB 46 48 I forgot um, yeah but she she did a lot with Kiyoshi Kurosawa like before we vanish or to the ends of the earth and she was in Shin Godzilla and um, yeah yeah what was that movie uh, I am what I am a wonderful movie that uh, played some festivals um, in 2022, 23. Uh, wonderful. Anyway, she does a lot of good stuff and she's uh, terrific in this movie as well. Uh, keep an eye on her. And then we have three lesser known people, or, or at least in the West lesser known, because I guess um, people in Japan will know them. Uh, one is Kai Bashida and he seems to be mostly a YouTuber. Same goes for Karma, um, who was at least, I think, in uh, The Alien Artist, which is an absolutely amazing movie and should be released by someone with good taste because it's, it's fantastic and wonderful and uh, completely insane, somewhere between a tasteful, stylish uh, indie movie, uh, Takashi Miike Insanity and uh, animation Apocalypse, and uh, yeah, and so someone with good taste should release that movie because uh, fantastic. Anyway, so two uh, YouTubers, and then with Mondo Otani, who seemingly did some martial arts and some modeling and some other stuff, and then someday got into uh, acting. And um, yeah, he hasn't done that much that we might know so far. And yeah, then we've got some. Uh, of the regular stuff. I'm not going through them all to watch the other videos. You should do that anyway um, to see who they are. But yeah, the general uh, cast is here. A little bit sad. Their boss um, played by... by, 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 by uh, wait. I always forget him and he's not even listed here on a letterbox to uh, pay attention to him. But uh, their boss who I regularly forget um, is just per phone call voice here, not being seen on screen. But we got our two um, uh, uh, dead body disposal um, experts, so that's uh, very cute. And uh, yeah, the reason why we don't see the boss is this whole movie is set in Miyazaki. And with that, I guess we go briefly and very shallow into the story just uh, what it's about um it's about our two lovely um professional killers mahiro and shisato who are in miyazaki to enjoy some holidays and do a little bit of work and suddenly they meet this um crazy dude who is not so pleased to meet them and uh, causes a lot of trouble 
and uh, yeah, likes to spread death and suffering around the world. And uh, that's of course Hosuke Ikematsu. And um, yeah, there's a lot of stuff going on, and uh, it's a little bit more um, with a Mission Impossible vibe, according to the director. But I will get into that later. So a few words in general, what my impression is. Um, many people, of course, if you have a trilogy like that, people start discussing what's the best, what's the worst. Yeah, and some people say, oh, this is the second best. And I'm like, how do you decide that? Because this is how you make a sequel. You take the parts from the previous movies that are good and then you give it a different twist so you don't repeat yourself all the time. That's what they did here. So I would say it's different enough from the other two to not even like consider to compare them. It's just a matter of mood. Like how or what, what part I like the most. I would say this is the slickest, best produced of, obviously they had the most money here because, uh, yeah, uh, now it's already a relatively famous brand, so now at least the movie plays in some bigger cinemas as well, and uh, seemingly does very, very well in cinemas, so people come and uh, watch it. So the two times I watched it was Friday and Sunday evening, so usually the uh, so-called late shows that aren't even that late are not the most popular, but it was still pretty full. Not sold out, but yeah, plenty of people there to uh, watch it, and uh, it was wonderful. Most actually behaved, that's even greater. Um, anyway, I'm not here to complain about uh, cinema audiences, they usually are terrible. Uh, here in Japan it's slightly better, but uh, yeah. Good, so um, yeah, so I, I wouldn't even dare to compare them because it's just a matter of my f daily needs, let's say it like that, uh, what I prefer. So I, I would say that they're all on the same level by now. Um, and they're all super, super fun and amazing and wonderful. So this is at l definitely the one that's the most action-packed, like the director said. It's a little bit inspired by spy movies like Mission Impossible. So yeah, there's a more story-driven focus. It's more focused on action. Um, some people say it's darker than the others. I wouldn't agree with that so much. I mean, tiny bit maybe, but um, uh, I will get into that. Maybe now let's let's do that now. So, uh, why do I think this is not exactly? darker or why do other people believe maybe why it's darker so i think the important point here why it seems darker or more serious is the um way the story is being told the first one is very much very very old uh, sakamoto where you have two groups of people who do their stuff and somehow um get involved in each other's business and then it escalates. That's something he did in his old movies a lot. There's not really a plot the way it's told. It's pretty messy and um, yeah, you actually have a lot of uh, benefits if you rewatch it because it's, 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 the whole plot structure is so weird and um, seemingly doesn't make any sense the first time. So I highly recommend uh, watching the first one a second time. If you haven't done that already, it might get much, much better. Anyway, so that's very much all over the place. And um, there's a lot of focus on daily things, like the whole middle part seemingly is just the girls hanging out at home. And um, so it, it feels a little bit lighter. But when we get to the end, we still have a lot of bloodshed and... Uh, 
Mahito is at the point where she's like, oh my god, I might have died here. So, I, I don't think it's uh, so light, at least in certain regards. And the second one is, I feel it tonally with this focus on like um, economical aspects, uh, the chances of young people to rise up in society. And these things are already pretty heavy, even though these topics are presented in a very light way. But I think the most essential part in the second one is that the main characters, if you look at it from a normal um, story writer perspective, the protagonists are the villains, like they have the goal, they have the things they want to achieve, um, they go on the hero's journey, their mentor gets killed and um, all these things, so they experience, they, they lose the first confrontation uh, with their enemies and that's usually the thing where you would say, okay, they lost the first time, but now they have an idea how to beat them or they try harder or whatever. And then they go into the final battle and somehow achieve victory. Would be the normal mode of storytelling, but here, because uh, it's all inverted, those are, from our perspective, the villains. And uh, yeah, if we would see it from that perspective, it would be pretty much what we see in this new movie, where uh, this whole uh, hero's journey and things to achieve and a goal and being actually active, like the protagonists have not been really active in the first two movies, just when someone actively challenges them, they go and uh, fight, but they need to be forced to fight. And here it's still a little bit similar, but... Um, yeah, in the end, they actually have this goal. They want to do this mission. This movie is completely focused on their job. And so much spoiler needs to be presented. Now, like, um, first time they can't beat the enemy. And that gives the whole movie the vibe of, oh my god, this could all be the end. And... Um, that's the way the movie was advertised. So, yeah, they, they went into everything a little bit more dramatic, a little bit more bloody. This movie is much, much bloodier and gory than the others. But um, that's all nothing new if we look at uh, Sakamoto's movies. It's a little bit newer in the Baby Assassin's movies. But if you look at how this new villain is presented, the um, character played by Ikematsu. It's, it's not so different from previous psychopaths he had in his movies. So, um, and even though he's completely crazy and uh, enjoys killing, he's still a very fun and kind of likable character. Like, he's not by default evil and um, he's just a little bit um, pitiful and tragic and uh, yeah so that's what I feel like some people might see as darker I just feel like it's a uh, dirtier grittier and uh, here's a word that I couldn't find during my um, during my review of Part two, I think it was a stakes, um, what I called a Fallhöhe, which um, the two main characters in part two didn't really have because they just want to return to their normal life. But um, yeah, it's just a matter of time until that would actually happen. And here you actually have uh, stakes, uh, the so called Fallhöhe, and um, yeah, it might end badly for them. But yeah, like, like I said, like in the first two. I mean, in the second one, because of the weird perspective, we never had the feeling that they might actually lose. So they had to do this little trick in the final fight to make it more look like uh, the others have a chance. But um, I don't really think it's, it's so different. It's just a grimier, grittier, little bit more dramatic 
but overall it's not a dark movie it's still very very funny it still has these um uh, daily life aspects even though they're not at home and uh, all characters are very fun like i said even the villain is very very funny at least in some moments and um yeah, I, I never ha had the, the feeling that we're now in a super serious, uh, dark movie. It's just a slight shift, I would say. And uh, we have a lot of references to the other movies. I did some some things that I liked so, so much. I, I, I loved this one scene that I can talk about in the spoilers. But um, yeah, something that was on an emotional level, not even so much related to this story, but something that gave me a lot. And that's the one thing this movie does absolutely brilliantly and completely opposite to the TV show while achieving the same thing. Like we emphasize the relationship between the two main characters in this case by putting them into dramatic action and um, having them actually fear for their lives while the uh, TV show does the complete opposite where almost no action actually happens and if there's action then no real enemies for them and it's all very playful and friendly it's more like summer holidays and that's something we will get to in a second um, something very interesting that I didn't know but um, yeah, like in the in the TV show, they have these two characters just play with each other and enjoy and do stuff. And uh, here, it's a little bit fun and games, but a lot more, um, yeah, being happy to be together, which is actually one of the main points of the whole story and their relationship with the enemy and... Uh, yeah, that's super, super interesting. I will explain that later more. But uh, so far, maybe um, about the story and the characters um, without spoilers. Um, I basically liked almost everything about this movie. There's little nitpicky things. I still don't like the sound mix so much. Here in the fight scenes, you have music that, that fits the fights. I think it's actually composed uh, to match the fights and it's very focused on rhythm and percussion and uh, bass to make it more impactful. But everything else that might resemble a melody is so far in the background it's really a little bit sad, especially since when the title credits come, was well, easy, what's the title insert comes, um, you have this, this like really um, spy movie-esque music which is very very nice and I enjoyed very much. Um, so that was good but uh, same at the beginning when they're on their holiday part of the story they play a song and I've rarely heard a song that sounds so flat and without any power in a movie so the sound mix has always been an issue with these movies same with the um, color grading there's a lot of stuff that's especially like night scenes just drenched in teal and orange and i hate it but i mean it's it's every movie it's not just every japanese movie it's every movie like every big budget hollywood movie looks like you vomit uh, you vomit after eating smurfs and it's just disgusting and i i don't know why anyone with good taste would do that but i guess you don't get around it uh, even if you try i have no idea um yeah but that's my pet peeve i hate it so much and i hope this era of blue and orange and blue will uh, soon end but it won't and uh, i guess i will have to tolerate it or every movie critic should just complain about it until they stop which would be lovely please complain about the stuff but yeah the, the tiny stuff i mean uh yeah here the scenes where that happens are still so good it doesn't really matter just if you're on a like bad mood and you want to fight about something uh, yeah and the first time i watched this movie i felt like there are few too many 
references to the first two movies, but then I thought in the context of the story, it makes a lot of sense. And if you consider that this movie should have the feeling of, oh, this might actually be the end, it's maybe good to put the stuff in to give it more of a feeling of, oh my gosh, we are looking back like our life flashes as for our mind before we die or something like that. So, so to, to give this more of a little bit um, dramatic feeling, it makes a lot of sense to reference the old movies. And um, the uh, director even said that he considers two and three a set, but we will get to that in a minute. Um, yeah, so it's all, all very, very small things that I didn't like about this movie. Everything else was just amazing, especially um, uh, 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 Miss Maida, Atsuko Maida, um, is uh, amazing. It's great in this movie. Like, she's having a verbal, constant verbal duel with um, uh, Akari Takaishi, and it's just gorgeous, wonderful. I'm yeah, just no, and uh, it's it's uh, great. The other characters are very fun as well. Uh, the action is just constantly happening, and if it's not happening, you get back to these small daily life things, and um, basically, it's all just building up on the relationship between the characters. And uh, wow, wow, this whole movie is just. Uh, Great. That's like, like I said, this, this is how you actually make a sequel. Yeah, you build on the stuff you have, you change stuff, um, you, you keep what's important, you keep what fans like, you keep what makes the series the series. Yeah, and that doesn't, doesn't work. Um, so I would say congratulations, Mr. Sakamoto. This is, uh, the best version of what might have happened here so great i'm completely completely excited and uh, full of love um so yeah if, if, let's go a little bit uh, deeper into stuff by talking about the pamphlet and um the interviews were yeah, a little, little, little bit interesting. Um, we start with the interview with uh, Miss Takaiji. What's interesting in this pamphlet? Um, the first three interviews of uh, Takaishi Izawa Sakamoto, um, they all built up the mystery of a different version of part three um, that she talks about like, hey, I really, really like that story too, but we still don't really know what, oh, hey? why is that different three? What's going on? Um, yeah, will be explained later. And yeah, she said here's a bigger gap between the goofy stuff and the more serious stuff, and it's more focused on the serious side of assassins, and yeah, that makes uh, sense, and um, Interestingly, she says our villain is not even scary because of his actions, but more of the way he talks, and that makes a lot of sense too. And um, what she said is really interesting about uh, playing or acting with Saudi Isawa is that uh, she's always thinking, like, should I cry in the scene? Should I do this? Should I do that? While Isawa just plays the way she feels it, like she's not putting too much thought in it. It's just like more emotional acting and uh, then she just joins in and goes with the flow. So that's interesting. Um, yeah, and then uh, we go to Miss Isawa who said, oh, uh, when they shot number two, there were plans to do three at the same time and somehow that disappeared and didn't happen. And uh, But she said that Sakamoto always keeps a planning sequel, so I guess this might not even be the end. I would be very surprised if this is the end, because uh, now it's a big success, and uh, big successes usually get sequels, right? Um, 
little bit sad to hear is uh, after they finished shooting part two, she had uh, pretty big issues with her mental health, um, some kind of depression and anxiety. She couldn't move the way she wants and had big trouble here. But when they started shooting this one, she got a lot of energy from Takaishi and Ikematsu. And um, yeah, seems to have some trouble here, which uh, hopefully is over. And uh, yeah, uh, Sakamoto finally explains this mystery other third part. He said two and three should have um, be shot one after another and should have been released at the same time, but then COVID happened and um, somehow they managed to finish part two, but yeah, part three just got stopped and then um, and got delayed for a while. Uh, the plan was something like um, summer holidays in an assassin's house, uh, basically, uh, what is it, a senpai, uh, an older a co-worker or something from Chisato, and uh, yeah, got uh, scrapped and rewritten, and um, but I I feel like this is um, summer holidays in an assassin's house could be uh, what's going on in the TV show currently, uh, which I like very much. So maybe there's a little crossover that's not really visible in the work itself, but uh, interesting. And he said in the beginning there was a little bit different plan for the villain who was more of a crazy um, killer who just kills random normal people. And um, he, he, he uh, was, uh, there, there was an idea that he kidnaps a boxer to train him. There was even a big airplane scene at the beginning in the original script, but uh, script, but they couldn't get uh, the airplane and stuff. So there were a lot of ideas, and then Ikematsu came in and they started to talk about the character, and they tried to find a way where between like empathy and uh, well, disempathy. So uh, empathy, empathy, no? and disempathy. So um. Yeah, like like they try to give you some scenes where you can feel his issues, but then in other scenes you should be more like, oh, what's going on here? What's wrong with him? Yeah, and uh, as is one one funny funny thing about the whole um, villain thing, like one of his goals is to find friends, and um, there's a quote from One Piece and uh, Sakamoto imagines that um, this villain uh, secretly reads One Piece and cries because uh, he wants to be like them and find a lot of friends. <laughs> and uh, there was even a scene in the movie where his uh, only friend uh, gets killed in front of him. Um, yeah, and uh, one more thing that gives a whole like story arc for this movie, which I like very much because it gives the fights more meaning and um, gives the fights a little bit of a storytelling element. Um, it's basically the flying headbutt monogatari, so the tale of the flying headbutt. Um, I, I think the first and probably the second one um, they won the final fight with a flying headbutt, and this is here um, implemented. Uh, very, very funny. Um, Sakamoto had an idea that said, "Oh, uh, there should be uh, the first fight, and it should be lost by not hitting this flying headbutt. And in the final fight, there needs to be some way." to turn this into a win and that's what he told um, Sonomura and he was like okay uh, we've got to find out how to tell a story with a flying headbutt and that's amazing and I love it. Um, in the interview with Sonomura um, he talks a little bit how he came into the series and he says there were six days 
shooting time and I hope that was just for the action scenes but um, yeah he felt a little pressured but with uh, Izawa in the lead he felt like okay he can do that and he can do stuff that's not the typical uh, like women's action movie with a lot of explosions and uh, somersaults and stuff but more like technical fighting and he said one of the good points is that you can believably show her like loose or tending to lose because she's relatively small and light so the enemies might just lift her up and throw her away and so that makes it all very interesting for him to do and he he told a little fun story about uh, the script that Sakamoto writes he said usually the fight scenes are just like two pages full of thoughts that the characters have while fighting like the, the fight itself is not explained just their feelings and then he gets a vibe that he should put into the uh, scene and uh, yeah uh, by the way this whole headbutt idea I, I, I forgot that it comes in late in the interview um, comes from uh, Mr. Uh, Masayuki you know uh, you know Mr. Kunioka about who we will have to talk a lot here on this channel because he's uh, amazing but um uh, yeah, so far to the um, about the interviews, and I guess now we just have to deal with the little bit more detailed report of what I experienced. So, first of all, I really like the structure here. We have a tiny flashback that makes sense uh, here, but we start at the beach. Um, our two protagonists seem like they're having a great uh, time and they're like almost normal people. Um, in the whole movie, Chisato is much closer to herself in the first movie, not so much the TV show where she feels much more normal, but here she has a lot of these weird mannerisms that she had in the first one, but without being so noisy so tiring and so unfriendly so she's like a nicer version of part one which i liked very much she still or again makes uh, dog walking noises um good very nice and uh yeah so they start at the beach it's very nice and then they have to do this job we have a nice big action scene that's set before the beach um, that shows us how they worked before this happened and they're looking forward to Mahiro's 20th birthday, which is the thing I, I wanted to check that before I start this um, video I completely forgot about. But as far as I remember, they graduated high school in the first uh, before the first movie and they changed the insurance plan after that and they have to pay two years of insurance so usually in Japan you graduate high school when you're 18 and then plus two years of insurance payment. Why aren't they already 20? I'm confused by this timeline. Maybe I messed up or Sakamoto messed up. More likely I messed up. But if someone wants to check that again, uh, please tell me in the comments below. Um, I'm a little bit confused by that. But this is one of the whole, uh, one of the big themes that connects uh, these two that uh, intensifies their relationship like uh, Mahito's 20th birthday and it's very very lovely how that plays out throughout the film. Uh, Chisato obviously forgot it and then makes up for it in the end. Um, lovely. And um, yeah this first action scene that we get uh, they fight a bunch of faceless dudes in some kind of alleyway or at night they have like red and blue ponchos it made me feel very uncomfortable uh, but look amazing and um, there we already see that Akari Takaishi is way more involved in the action than she used to be and that's very nice as well because that was already the big uh, criticism like she goes to the final battle and then somehow disappears for some reason so Mahiro has to do everything by herself and here she's involved in 
every action scene, even the final battle, even though she does less than Mahido, but that's totally okay. She's an integral part of the action and that's very, very good and makes me more excited for Sonomura's new movie, A Ghost Killer, which will be uh, great as well, I guess. Uh, very, very excited. Anyway, um, so that makes clear, like, uh, sets the tonality very well and, um, very soon they have to go to work, they have the mission to kill the, some random dude, and when they arrive there, they see this other killer, and they're like, oh, some kind of double booking, what's going on here? And uh, he's very upset because he was looking forward to killing this guy, he has this plan of killing 150 people, and now there's, there's these two girls who well, annoy him, and uh, yeah, there's a big fight, and this first fight is so wonderful it's in, set in some kind of a city hall or something and the way they use the room and the walls it's wonderful it's just tremendous i was uh, yeah uh, very excited and um it's big um, thing and like I said there's the headbutt storyline and this was a moment that really like made me <gasps> no? and basically they have this big fight and Mahito is already uh, kind of losing and then she does this fake and jumps and tries to hit him and he does the Samoa Joe and just takes a step to the side and looks at her and while she's flying in front of him, he's just bam and uh, headbutts her into the ground, and she's done. And it's such a sudden, surprising, impactful thing. Like countering a head, a flying headbutt with a normal headbutt is just wonderful. And uh, there will be a payoff to this in the final fight. Um, yeah, I, I, I love the action here. It's just amazing. And then they somehow survive, they meet their new team, uh, which they uh, don't really want to join, but somehow they get involved. This is very much like the stuff in um, every day, um, like this people forcing them into doing stuff that they don't want to do. But uh, yeah, they, they start getting into this team and uh, we have um, this constant constant fight between uh, these two characters uh, played by Atsuko Maeda and Akari Takaishi. I, I think the, the, the Maeda character is called uh, Iruka, yeah, Iruka Minami. I think Iruka is a dolphin. Anyway, she, she, she's amazing. Like, she has this really, like, bitchy side. Uh, she's really annoyed by them. She's always, like, talking down on them. And, uh, really, really great. And, um, Similar to the first movie, slowly, of course, she gets implemented in the um, in the group, into the group, and there's a big apology scene, uh, very similar to the first one, where uh, Mahito can join the Go Kaku, and it's a uh, very very lovely later. So this all helps to improve the relationships and stuff. Uh, another very big scene, um, they get a hint where our killer lives and they go there, they find his uh, diary and stuff, they find more about him. And then there's a, they, they sleep in a tent and they celebrate Mahito's birthday a little bit with uh, her first beer. And it's just a lovely scene how they sit there and uh, have a little chat and talk badly about uh, uh, the dolphin lady and uh, yeah that's very very much like every day so if you enjoyed the scene watch every day because there's much much more of that and it's wonderful and amazing um anyway there are some more action we've got the two in very gorgeous glamorous outfits like you need in a big um spy movie you need to change outfits and costumes you need to dress up and uh, wear a costume or something and uh, that's happening here it looks amazing and suddenly our disposal people come and look like the goof they are and it's a wonderful 
um, we get some some more characters for action, but uh, let's not stick to the story too much. So from there on, it's just like yeah, they somehow get to the big final fight. Let's talk about the main villain a little bit more because he's super interesting. Like his whole character arc is he somehow gets into killing and um one of the first people he kills at least the first one he kills with a gun is a lady who sells uh, lunch boxes and she doesn't give him chopsticks and he asks for chopsticks but she just ignores him and talks to the other customers so he has to sit down somewhere on the street lonely and eat everything with his hands and uh, in the evening after she finishes her job he goes there and kills her and uh, feels a big satisfaction and what they do very cleverly in this movie is they show clearly that he is basically Mahiro without a friend and his big goal is to find friends and at some point he finds some friends um, and it's so funny how he sits in, in a car surrounded by people and one of them is actually willing to talk to him about his uh, killing diary and uh, his gun and he's really excited and it's, it's so cute just to see this psychopath share his passion for killing with someone. It's so wonderful. If you can't laugh about this, it's uh, something wrong with you. But yeah, he kind of reminds me of very early um, Sakamoto movies um, where well, uh, you have some completely insane character that's somehow grounded in this idea that he doesn't want to do bad, but somehow killing is it the right thing to do. Maybe a little bit like Hangman's Not, but here it's more charming, nicer, a little bit more lovable, a little bit more understandable, at least a little bit. And... um yeah, but, but that uh, feels like a nice next step for something we've seen in um, Sakamoto movies before. So I like that very much. There's even a scene he kills um, a bunch of people in a greenhouse with a lot of knife stabbing, which felt very much like old Sakamoto movies where we always had these excessive knife stabbing scenes. And uh, yeah, feels like a little, little callback to those times and... Uh, Wonderful. I, I enjoyed this villain so much. He does so, so many crazy things that are, yeah, a little bit over the top, but somehow you get a feeling like, yeah, he just wants a friend. He just wants to connect to people and he wants to kill people. At the same time, yeah, Mahito enjoys killing people. She's a psychopath too, but she has a friend at home where she can just sit down and eat cake or ice cream and look like a little child and enjoy life. And um, there's an interesting dialogue scene in the final fight, which completely made me like, oh, this is so nice and beautiful. Like they're talking about, like uh, Ikimatsu's character uh, says, oh, here you are my strongest enemy ever. And uh, that's wonderful. I'm so happy to be here with you. And he asked her, who was your strongest enemy? She said, I don't know. I don't remember who I kill. So he asked, like, who was the most fun? Then she's like, oh, I remember these two brothers who were fun and they were strong. And I liked the scene so much because if you watched my video about part two, I still thought it's a very sad that these two brothers just get killed very violently without any empathy. Yeah, I, I felt like the, the four characters had a strong enough bond to at least make the girls feel bad about killing these two guys, but it was shot in a way that was a little bit too cool for my taste. So I was really, really happy that these two other characters, who I at least um, enjoyed very much and who I had a lot of empathy for because they were 
written very well and understandable and their goal just to rise up in society and have a more enjoyable life by having a little bit more money and not having to eat garbage all the time um, is very yeah something people can understand easily and so i always felt like they're very compelling characters and they were killed off too easily and now they finally get some respect uh, like Mahiro even says, oh, I should at least have asked them for their names. At least that. And, yeah, I, I feel like the character, the director, so the writer, and everyone realized, okay, we, we messed up a little bit in part two. Let's fix this in part three. And it just moved me way more than I expected. And this was just a glorious, gorgeous moment in this movie. And, um, gave the whole final fight much more emotional weight and made it more beautiful for me, at least. And, uh, yeah, wonderful. I really, 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 really appreciated this um, fixing of my main point that I didn't like about part two. So it will be a joy to just watch them all in a row and feel like, okay, they will get what they deserve later. And it's wonderful. And uh, yeah, so, so this whole character arc of the main villain, especially with this One Piece comment, is very fun. Another very fun thing is um, uh, 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 Maida's character, who has this... Um, so we have this big apology scene. And before that, in this tent scene, the girls are already talking like, ah... Yeah, she's so mean and she, no. but uh, then Mahiro is already like, ah, don't be so strict with her, don't be so angry. There's probably something in her past, like a difficult childhood, something with her parents or no money or something like that. And uh, how they pay it off in this apology scene is uh, just gorgeous because she suddenly comes out and... Uh, her, her partner wants to interrupt her, like, oh, no, 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 I want to talk to them, like, very openly. I want to explain everything. And then she comes with, yeah, you know, when I was in junior high school, I identified with Ai Haibara from Conan too much, so I was very... Much like this, like rude and looking down on people. I lost all my friends, but I respected Haibara so much I can't hate her. And uh, yeah, that's how I be became like this. And Mahiro immediately, oh yeah, yeah, I understand what you mean. I get your feeling. Don't don't worry. <laughs> and it's so weird. It's so stupid. Like that's the silliest reason to be a bad person ever. Yeah, you like a. Uh, an anime character too much and it's just hilarious wonderful and um yeah like i said when when they finish this they go to yeah, go, like you pass the uh, apology test uh, same thing that uh, chisato did with mahido in the first movie um like that we have a lot of references to the other movies um, they have this quote that the old guy uses for um, Masaki Suda. Uh, what is it? Uh, Bijin Bakuhatsu or something like some beauty explosion stuff. I don't know. I don't remember. Uh, anyway, that, that comes up. They have a cake again. You have the dog tripling noises. You have a lot of small stuff that's very similar. And it makes sense, like I said, in the way that you should feel this could be the end. So it's nice to let the other things pass. Of course, we have the reference to the brothers in the final fight. Um, so it, it's nice to let things come back to remember. So when it's over, no, we got back to that. That gives all more drama and weight and uh, works pretty well. But the other thing is that this explains uh, completely, like, 
makes it more understandable the thing that the villain wants and they have the thing of hey there's a friend who you have a long history with that you can reference that you can talk about that can come up again while he just has a, a diary of people who he killed and where he ranked them like who was the strongest and the weakest and so on and in the end, they're talking about the birthday and he's already on the ground dead or something, but you still hear his voice that says, oh, when is even my birthday or something like that. And um, yeah, that makes more clear this gap between them. Like, uh, yeah, they have a history and he has nothing. He has a, little, a lot of dead people. And um, yeah, so minor criticism because not not even it, it's not even bad because I reference the older movies it's just like I'm so sick of references to other things um, because of Hollywood movies because that's all they do all the time um, that I was like oh, do we need it yeah we need it here it makes total sense so um, yeah cool so at the end, just some some very minor things that I noticed. Um, they played a trailer for the upcoming documentary about the making of the movie, and uh, Mahiro is actually wearing a Mega Man shirt. Great, I love that. Um, then, like all the characters in this movie, have a different uh, fighting style, which is pretty cool. Like they fight one killer who shows up who has more like this kung fu animal style uh, which is really funny and weird and very entertaining then you have more the uh, big muscle boy uh, here with the what was his name uh, Mondo Otani who is like super big and big muscles and stuff and he just kicks the enemies around and they roll on the ground and stuff it's uh, super Fun, well, yeah, Atsuko Maeda is uh, focused on just walking around and shooting. Uh, she's not so much the physical type, but it's uh, very cool that like each of them has their own type of fighting, and it's very nice to have. Um, one last thing that I think. Um, there's a scene where they talk about Mahiro's hairstyle and they ask uh, uh, the dolphin lady for advice what kind of hairstyle. And I'm not sure her hairstyle in uh, every day is slightly different. Does it mean every day is after this one? I have no idea. Uh, I'm still looking for the connection between the show and this movie, if there is one. I'm not so convinced anymore but uh, would be nice if there was so at least uh, like I said there's this a talk about um, the hairstyle um, I think Mahiro is wearing a, a hat that she's wearing in the show as well which is uh, very very um, cute and uh, especially like at in the end um, she has this hat and a big bandage on her cheek and yeah it looks very very funny uh, in general uh, in in the fight scenes like she gets smacked in the face lots of the blood comes out and with the blonde hair she looks a lot like uma sermon in a uh, kill bill i mean i like kill bill so it's good why not uh just something that came to mind during the fight scenes and uh yeah i guess that's all for now if I have more maybe after the documentary I guess I will talk about Baby Assassins again and there will be more episodes about the show so I, I guess we will get to this someday again or maybe when the Blu-ray comes out I will talk about it again like, like I said at a different point um, uh, reviews are always work in progress and next time you watch a movie it's a completely different movie you will have a you will see completely different stuff like I did with the first two. Um, like I said, in the in our German podcast where I talked about them earlier this year, 
I was a little bit mad at part two for some stuff that they did that I understood next time much better. And with this one, they even fixed it uh, completely. So ev everything, new context, new uh, stuff. And um, yeah, I just uh, will probably get back to this series of uh, movies and the TV show a lot, which is good. But we will talk about the other... Um, Sakamoto movies as well and every time I pick up something there that I feel like oh that's something he did here as well we will talk about that um, especially my parallel between Hangman's Knot and maybe here the villain or maybe um, Slaughter Jab as well there is a funny thing that um, in in the review for part 2 we talked about how the heroes he was also the protagonist. I don't show up for the first like 10 minutes. And in Slaughter Jab is this funny thing where you spend, I think, at least 20 minutes with two characters who are not the main characters, which is really, really weird. Um, but yeah, another thing that he did before and then again. And uh, he just likes to recycle ideas, I guess. And yeah, like I said, we will get to this more and uh, talk about it more often probably I will uh, go to bed now because it's already really late and then I will remember something that I wanted to say and didn't say and uh, that's how it goes like uh, with the review for part two this is what uh, drove me crazy I woke up at five in the morning I was like stakes in the video I still Oh, this is not so easy to translate because I checked some dictionaries who just gave me like professional expressions for theater uh, or very uh, technical things like the hide from where you fall. But now it's just steaks. Give me steaks, especially the ones for eating. I want to eat steak. I'm hungry. I'm on a diet. I hate dieting. Probably since the first video here. Got released, I lost 12 kilo. Good boy. Anyway, um, this movie is completely amazing. I love it. I want to watch it another 10 times or so. And it was probably the first time since Shin Kamen Rider that I went to the cinema. I left and I was like, can I go again? Or the next day I thought, mm, can, I, can I see it again? <laughs> so now, luckily, the thing was I wanted to go on the first day. So I wanted to... Um, reserve a seat early so I get seats that I like or at least I, I get into the cinema at least because it could be sold out or something so I had to buy a ticket online and then I couldn't use here my uh, lovely pre-order a uh, pre-buy ticket yeah this one here this is, by the way, a scene from the movie with a different background. So they took this picture somewhere else. Um, anyway, so, uh, by the way, a great, um, not just one scene, like piece of the movie where they fight a million enemies and it's just spectacular. With little, what are sickles or something? Uh, it looks very, very violent. It's not as violent as it looks, but it's very, very good. Anyway, so uh, because I had to buy it online and couldn't use that suddenly I was like oh I still have this pre-buy ticket that I should use before the movie is out of cinemas could be out tomorrow because it's uh, not successful obviously now but it was just a good excuse to go again and watch it again before I did this video it was a good decision because like even between the f these two watches it was a bit different and uh, I could focus on other things that I didn't notice the first time because the first thing I just pumped and hyped and the second time I realized how short this movie actually feels with this 113 minutes and uh, yeah feels really really short it's really really great and uh, yeah I will just go to bed now and uh, I'm probably so hyped that I can't sleep again, and uh, it's a very annoying thing. I should sleep sometimes, because tomorrow I have a really, really long shift at work, but that's nothing for this here. We can have a nice little chat at some other point in time when there are some viewers who actually uh, are interested in my gibberish. Um, so that's it for today. Have a nice 
day or whatever is ahead of you. Enjoy it and um, see you soon. Bye.